Okay, this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on June the 7th in the year 2017 here at the Niles Public Library in the third floor boardroom. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff here and I'm speaking with Mr. Martin Passarella. Uh, Mr. Passarella was born in Chicago and now lives in Niles, Illinois. Uh, Mr. Passarella learned of the Veterans History project through contact with some of the staff members here who have been interviewing veterans uh, since uh, 2005 when the Niles Library uh, joined the national effort coordinated by the Library of Congress. Uh, Mr. Passarella, Marty has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project and here is his story. Um, by way of uh, preface, uh, Marty is our first Vietnam veteran uh, to be interviewed since 2005. So uh, we really appreciate his uh, uh, coming in today and being the first of our local Niles veterans from the Vietnam War uh, uh, to speak in this decade with us. So Marty, uh, when did you enter the service? I got my draft notice and my induction notice and I entered a service on the 22nd of July 1966 uh, left from Chicago, Illinois via train to St. Louis and uh, went for my basic training at Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Uh, Marty, uh, where were you living at the time? Oh, I was still living at home with my, my mother. I was 22 years old. In Chicago? In Chicago, yeah. yeah. Did you attend high school in Chicago? Uh, no, I didn't. I actually, uh, there's, there's, I have a background. My father passed away when I was seven. My mother, uh, as I was getting along, along in my year, you know, growing up, my mother, uh, to avoid me ending up as a juvenile delinquent, uh, sent me to a, a school called Glenwood School for Boys in, in Glenwood, Illinois. And it was for a school from... Uh, for boys with uh, broken homes by a death, death or separation, death or divorce, and it just so happened that the, it had a military background. Okay, so yeah, I when I went into service, I knew how to, I knew knew first order. I didn't, you know, I knew close quarter drill. I knew uh, everything about, you know, about a rifle, how to drill with a rifle. Uh, I could disassemble an M1 rifle when I was 12 years old. So uh, I got the basic training. I adapted much, re much more readily than someone who did not have a background like that, even though it, was, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. But uh, a lot of that stuff that uh, when they were doing close order, learning close order drill, I was doing construction stuff for the, for the DIs, for the drill instructors. You know, we were working in the day room and putting up walls and stuff like that because I knew I already knew, knew that I didn't need it. I didn't need a refresher course. It's like a bicycle. Once once you get on, you, you know. Marty, when uh, did you live in a particular area of the city, a neighborhood? Uh, I live in a Humble Park neighborhood. I'm trying to try to think. Humble Park neighborhood. Uh, we lived at uh, on Iowa Street near Wood Street and Chicago Avenue. So, um, did you say you were drafted when you were at the age of 22? 22. 22. And you had a draft number. Oh no! Right. There was that. There was no. There was no lottery number at that time. That was like, uh, we need you. We need all forty thousand of you a month. Off you went. And when you were drafted, what were you doing? Were you were you working? I was then? an auto. I was. I was an apprentice auto mechanic. Were there other? Um, some of your friends or other people from the neighborhood were also drafted at the same time? Yeah, well, they were in it. I don't know if they were exactly, exactly at the same time. From my neighbor, I don't know of, of two other, two other uh, guys that served in the Vietnam. One was, one was killed in Vietnam. The other one you know, had a totally different type of experience than I did. Um, so you wound up in the Army. So that, that was because you were drafted. You didn't choose the Army. I didn't choose the Army. Of course, when you were drafted, you didn't get to choose the service neither. They could have taken you so that's a Marty, you're going to the you're going to the Army. Neil, you're going to the Marine Corps. And so they do, did split it up like that. And the the um, 
the fact that you were uh, had background in the um, auto mechanics that didn't affect the army's decision of how to where to direct. Oh, yeah, that's why that's 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 what I ended up at uh, in in the army. Eh. Trying to flesh this out a little bit. I finished my basic training. Normally, people you you go you'd go through your AIT, your advanced individual training, whatever. I was assigned to a, a, a permanent party unit in, in Fort Lewis, Texas. I had no AIT, no additional training. As a member of this, as a member of this light light direct support maintenance company, they were sending people to every improving ground, Maryland, to wheel and track school. Okay, so I was in the first group that went to went to wheel and track school. But when I got out of wheel and track, so I so my my Military, my MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, was a, a 63 Charlie 20, which was a wheel and track mechanic. A 63 Charlie 20? Yeah, 6320. 6320. So I was a wheel and track mechanic. I returned to my uh, stateside unit, but I was not in my stateside unit. I was in a, put in a holding company with a, little, with a signal company that was right, barracks were right next door, because my whole unit was on orders for Vietnam. So the people that they had out there, they were already replacing bodies in the in the company. So when we were coming back from the eight, from Aberdeen, Maryland, there was no there wasn't a slot for us. We were you know, and we were just we, like I said, it was a holding company. We were, we knew we were going to Vietnam, just to know exactly when. Um, were you an only child, or were there? Uh, no, I'm an only child. Only child. So it must have been uh, kind of a. I shouldn't have been there to start with, if you really want to think about it. Yeah, it couldn't have been a great. I mean, you don't do two brothers at the same time, and you don't. An only child's, you know, and you know, never really thought about it or gave it, you know, uh, made us think about it. I, yeah. I never really didn't think about it. It was just, you know, I, I just, I went. I mean, it must have been a hardship for your mom. Oh, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure yeah, it was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It wasn't much just my mom. My dad was, you know, my dad had passed away. Yeah. So um, the fact that you. Uh, was prepared in a way for the military because of your high school experience. Did grammar you find school too. Grammar school too. Yeah. Oh, that was wow. School, you know, I started in sixth grade right through. Right oh, through you were ready made. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it didn't seem like that. Did it seem like a big adjustment to this being in the army? Just the fact that it was military all day long, not like you know, yeah. you, were, you would go to school and then you still had your you had your parade formations and your your inspections and your and your drill stuff, but then it was it was military yeah. 24 hours. A day. So that so you were in Fort Leonard. Fort Leonard went for basic training, and then you were down Fort in Bliss, Fort Bliss, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, in El Paso, who was my yeah. permanent party assignment. Yeah. Was that the first time you were, of course, no, that wouldn't have been the first time you were away from home for a significant period of time, so. Well, the first time I was away from home was when I, when I, away from home was when I went from Chicago to the basic training and ah. basic training. And then I, and then, you know, we went, like I said, we went via train, but when I came home for, when I came home for leave after basic was the first time I was ever in an airplane. So I mean, I sat there with my mouth open with the air conditioner, you know, and, and that was one of the sides where you got the lunch on the plane, you could smoke on the plane, everything. You know, yeah. sitting there because you know you're 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 afraid. Yeah, and you were meeting people probably from all different parts of the country, walks of life. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, even one of the even one of the one of the it was it was an Italian guy uh, from New Jersey. There were two of them in my, in my company, and, you know, and one guy. That, then he pulled green away. I can remember the name. He he was a KIA in Vietnam. You know he got killed in Vietnam. But I mean, it's just you met from. I mean, you you, know, you leave from here. You you were with a lot of people from Chicago. But when you went someplace else, you met people from all over. And you were able to get along with most everybody. Just about. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, he, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there was some racial tension there, but I you know I didn't. I didn't find, you know, I didn't feel it. I just kind of tried to get along with everybody. Yeah. And Vietnam was a different story. <laughs> there was no, it, yeah, I'm sure somewhere in, you know, maybe after my period there, there, there was more racial tension. But, uh, you know, when you're, you know, when you're, the guy next to you is black, and the guy next to you is just is Hispanic, it doesn't matter that he's black or he's Hispanic. You know, you're all brothers. You all believe the same. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, do you recall when you departed for overseas duty? In I 
Let's see what it was. In, it was. It, it, it was in July. It was July of 1967. But if I was to give you a specific date, I don't recall. Yeah. And did you know from the beginning when you were drafted that you were most likely going to Vietnam? No, not really. Not really. Yeah. But when you got the news that you were going to Vietnam, did that have any? No, I mean, was I ready to go to Canada? No. But I suppose some people got to go to Germany or well, yeah, I mean, DMZ did. or Japan or someplace. But well, people did. But I mean, it's 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 the point. It was a it was a different time in this yeah. country. And years years later, uh, it was everybody didn't, nobody wanted to go. We had the you know we mm -hmm. had the we went, it was a different time in this country. You were still living you were still living with the death of death, death of President Kennedy and you know what can you do for your country and not ask what your country can do for you so you just you, you did it as a as blind patriotism okay I'll be it's not that yeah we should have been there no we shouldn't have been there you you did it because it was blind patriotism. you 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 know you really at that time period of time at that period of time if you didn't get drafted or you owed that you owed as a as a male individual you owed the the country six years of your life if you went in the military for three years, you still had three years of three years of, of reserve. Mm -hmm. Or people got out of going in the military beside the, the, the protest and running. I mean, people went in the Peace Corps. You know, you could do that. You could do that instead of going to the military. You could went into the Peace Corps yeah. and serve time in another country in some you know uh, impoverished African nation. You know, helping the people Peace Corps. So, uh, Marty, did you? When you, um, how did you make the journey to Vietnam? Was it by boat or we went plane? Home. We, I, I flew over TWA, but you know, at that, you know, we, we, I flew out of, uh, I left from Oakland Air, I, I flew out of whatever the air, what the air, air base was in, in, in San Francisco up in California. I don't know if it was Travis, I'm not sure. It was a night flight, and uh, I swear to God, it, it seemed like all we did was sleep, sleep and eat the whole time. It was, it was, it was dark, you know, it was dark. We had a one-hour layover in Honolulu because the, the planes couldn't have made it all the way, and we had another one-hour layover in uh, Kadena Air Base in Okinawa before we went to uh, before we landed at Dinhua Air Base in, in Vietnam. Coming back was the same; it was in reverse. But I flew Pan Am coming back, and that and that twenty-some hour flight was daylight the whole time because you're crossing the dateline, and it's kind of really. I left Vietnam. When I came home. I left Vietnam at one o'clock in the afternoon. And landed in San Francisco at six o'clock on the same day. And we were twenty some hours in the air. Yeah. yeah. So when you land in um, in Vietnam, um, was there a particular camp or? Well, there's a the story. We landed, we landed at the air base. We got on these buses. They had. Is that near Saigon or north? Yeah. North of yeah. Vietnam was a little, you know, Tonson Air Base, Tonson Airport Air Base was was basically was in, in Saigon, and Vietnam was a little a little further up was a different air base. You know, you could flow, you could have probably flown in either one. We flew into Vietnam, but earlier the flights were going to Tonson. We flew into Vietnam. We got on these buses. They had screw, you know heavy metal screens over the windows, so they could throw hand grenades inside the buses. And we went out, you know, we went out to uh, Long Binh Post, which was the largest largest post in uh, in Vietnam. And you, uh, we went into some company that's a uh, 90s replacement battalion. Okay? It was 90s replacement battalion at Camp Alpha, and uh, we got there. We got there in the afternoon, and, and you know, you, all you had to do, you had to make make the formations. So the evening formation, they were going to have people do kitchen kitchen police KP, right, all night. So this. this this one of the guys I was stationed in the States with, in, in Texas was says, well, come on, we'll go to the back of the formation. You know, What did they do? They pulled the back of the formation, put the back of the formation. So here we were doing KP the first day in Vietnam all night long. And all you had to do the next day because of all night KP was just to make the formation. We made the morning formation. Gone, I was sent to two fuel force. Two fuel force sent me to my unit. And, and that was day, that was day one, day, day one to do in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, what was the weather like? Was it... Uh it's, it's an adjustment a, to the climate it's, necessary? It's strange. Well, actually, I, I mean, even a letter I wrote my mother, I said, this country just smells like crap. You know, because it really did, you know, it had that stench. They fertilized Human it. Human fertilizer, yeah. I've heard it. Right? Yeah, so it had that stench. Uh, it's a tropical climate. You have, 
monsoon season, and, and I got there, I got there wet in the wet season. Ironically, people think when you hear monsoon, it's pouring like hell. It's like it starts at three in the afternoon, rains like hell, and it's the same time every every day, you know. And it's six months of rain, six months of dry. When you um, after you had that first day of uh, the KP duty, and then they sent you out two or three days later to no, I said it was the next day. I went to the Formation it, and then it, 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 it was that was the post that we replaced the battalion, sent you out to wherever if you were going to to to, to four you know one field force. So it, it was a two field force and and uh, it took in a lot of units. You know, were all under two field force, and then two field force sent me to my uh, sent me to the, the 234th Armor. Who at that time was detached from the Fourth Infantry Division Headquarters Company to two field force. So we were, I was still in the in the Binwa area. Okay. In August of that year, what uh, what they did was they took my battalion, which came over with the Fourth Infantry Division, and flipped us with the Armored Battalion that came with the 25th. So 169 went to the Fourth Infantry Division, 234 went to the 25th. Only thing was 234 never worked as a complete battalion. Headquarters Company was obtained in Tainan Base Camp. Alpha Company was at Kuchi. Bravo Company was with the with the First Infantry Division at Lai Kei, and Charlie Company was up in the DMC. So it's like, you know, we were never as, as one solid battalion unit. Yeah. Were you in one particular location? Well, after we left, after we got flipped, after, yeah. after, we, after we flipped, we left Camp Ashley, wherever it was. There. I'm saying at Binwari, we went convoy through 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 Saigon, went up. Highway 1, and then it turns into Highway QL1, turns into QL22, it splits. We, I, we were up near Cambodia. My, mm. my company was up near Cambodia. Alpha Company was at Kuchi. So uh, when you're in the near Cambodia at night, did you, did you sleep in a... Oh, we had regular... We had barracks we had, or... Yeah, here's, no. That's it there. That's, that's, ah. that's the hooch. Thank you. That photograph. So when we initially got there, we... We had a to go before we got up, got to because uh, we came in and in the dark we had to pull there was no roofs on we had to pull the military tents over the top the first night so it was you know it was covered and then when then when I went to the when I went to the field okay when I went to the field and when I came back they had the you know they they were done like this but uh, I was in a battalion maintenance platoon and when I when I got there I was just sick and tired of fix it trucks. I you know, didn't want anything to do with it, so I got I schemed my way into being being assigned to a uh, a model eighty eight VTR, which is a tank recovery vehicle. Vehicle tank recovery. And it's fifty something tons, you know, with four crew members. So I mean I was on that August, September, October, November, December. So you're out in the field recovering tanks. Oh yeah, well, I mean we we supported we supported, we supported Alpha Company. So I worked with Alpha Company, I worked with Charlie Company, worked on all these, uh, on, on this little farm I listed operations, so there's, there, there's operations that, were, that I worked with there, there, and then in December, uh, Charlie Company had, had come down, back down to uh, the Tainan province, so it, it, they hooked up with the, with the battalion headquarters, and uh, we had to give them our tank recovery vehicle, battalion means had two of them. Because they lost theirs in a river, so there we were. No, then you were you, you didn't you didn't have what you were doing for all those months. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Tet Offensive started in 19 in February in January 31st, 68. And and I had heard that a friend of mine that uh, from Alpha Company got killed. Our scout platoon, recon platoon, took casualties. Volunteered for combat. Finish my finish my tour of duty as in, in the recon platoon. Then it turns out that the that skip who I thought was killed wasn't wasn't. So well, what so what I uh, what I, I blame nobody or you know I what I got I, I maybe stupidly or however you want to look at it, but I asked for it so I can't say no. So the you listed battles and campaigns that you were involved in was Cunia. Cunia, yeah, Cunia. That was a that was a land clearing operation to uh, 
take away the hiding areas for the for the Viet Cong. Okay. Coley Coley was, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff was search and destroy. You look for them and, you know. So when you were, when those, in those um, campaigns or actions there, was that before you were in the, you were, that when you were in the vehicle recovery unit or was that after you volunteered for Up the, until Saratoga. Up until Saratoga. Saratoga was when I, Saratoga was when I joined the recon platoon. Then, then it was, then it was. Then it was uh, out in the high ground. Well, then it was then it was fun and games for yeah for the other rest of the time. And then it was QL thing and, and quit thing, quit thing, quit thing, and tone thing. And then the Tet Offensive of 1968. Well, that, those those operations, quit thing, and and, and that that fell in there, mm -hmm. Saratoga. But I mean, yeah, I was there for the Tet Offensive in '68, and uh, the Tet Offensive, of course, as you know better than I do, had. Uh, great effect on the, Amer the general American population's view of how the war was going. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, it, that's, you know... It were you surprised at the Tet Offensive when you were there? Oh, yeah, I caught everybody by surprise. Everybody? Yeah. I mean, they were, I mean, they were really, uh, they were really slick about it. I tell you, they're, they're, I, I, I'll tell you the guy's truth. I, I was at the library, and I was at the, I'm sorry, I was at the Half Price Books, you know, all oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. and I saw this book, and it had the, the, the little... Look, the tropic lightning, the patch it looks like a, you're referencing the Tony. Yeah, it looks like a strawberry yeah. with the like, with the lightning bolt. I picked it up and it says a hundred miles of bad road. And I said, well, it's about the three quarter cab, right? Third, third squadron, fourth cab, right? Which was the cab element of uh, 25th Division. So I said, well, yeah, I'm gonna buy the book and I'll pass it back to my friend Roger, to Roger McGill. I mean, you you, you might have remembered him from the uh, from the meeting yeah. over, who served with the three quarter cab, right? Then I found out Roger read, Roger already read the book. So I'm reading the book and I said, "Oh my God!" You know, I mean, beside the casual of this, these that they took, I mean, between January and May that year, they had to get 50 something killed. You know, and, and it's like they saved Thompson the airport, air, air base, air, air base when the, when the Tet Offensive started. And I'm thinking, like, I traveled the same roads. I swear to God, I went down to Saigon. We went down to Saigon. We had a a lot of, I don't want to say obsolescence, but we had a lot of destroyed road wheels and the tanks. And we had to dump this stuff. So this sergeant, the sergeant from my platoon says, we're going, right? Him, me, and a medic. It missed the convoy. Mm. You know, missed the convoy to Saigon. We're going from Cambodia to Saigon, the three of us in a Jeep, in January, when these people were probably digging in wherever the NVA, I mean, we were all just, it was like, my God, just flabbergasted read this book. And then to think about this, and, and, and the strangest thing is that I got a phone call from this medic, you know, that was looking for some other guy from the platoon that, you know, was, was a Chicago resident and all of that. And then it dawned on me that he was the third person in the chief. Wow. You know, and I was talking and talking to Steve. You were in a chief. And, uh, and it's just... And then I get, and then we got something. We got there, and then this. Well, we had we had to crane, unload this whole big trailer and stuff. So now we had some free time. So we're walking around Long Bend, and a black guy that I was from Chicago that I was in the states with, right? Hey, Spears, how you doing? And I'm talking. He's, oh, that kid, young, young kid, comes around a hooch. Right? They had better hooches than we did. They had all they were all metal with concrete floors and that, right? Hey, that kid, he, he's from Chicago too. And the kid walks over. And I looked at him. I looked at his name tape, and I says, uh, Where are you from? Of course, you get the same routine. I'm from Chicago. We're in Chicago, Northwest Side. We're on a now you're gonna. We're on a Northwest Side, Kelvin Park. I said, you got a sister about so tall, blonde. Her name is Barbara. My wife was going to college with this kid's sister. Wow. I mean, it, when when it when it comes to this involvement in, in, in Southeast Asia, this is like some really really. Really strange things happen. I mean, it's the life world is such a small place. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marty, you received a Purple Heart with the Oak Leaf cl Cluster. Yeah. During what campaign or battle it was there? Yeah, it was during the Tet Offensive. I uh, actually was wounded on 29th of February, 68, but they never awarded me the Purple Heart. I was wounded on the 24th of March, 1968. I was medevaced on the 7th of May, 1968. Were those bullet wounds? Shrapnel wounds. Shrapnel. Shrapnel stole my legs. Uh, the, f the first two were, well, this one is, is, is minor compared to some, but I mean, the, the first two were, were minor shrapnel wounds. The last one I had to be, uh, the last one, that's, that's, 
that's a, that's a, the last one was a really a, a tough time for me because we had uh, I used to sleep outside on a on a, on a litter regular you know mm -hmm. stretcher. I don't want to sleep inside the vehicle. With yeah. Me. I still sleep outside. I slept outside, and all of a sudden, the explosion and I flipped off the litter, and I started crawling on the, on the outside toward the driver's compartment, and all hell broke loose. Art rocket propelled grenades and automatic weapons, and you know, and I, I couldn't get up. Get in so I came around the back, and I stood up, and I, I looked down. And the inside of my the inside of my thighs was nothing but blood. Mm. You know. So then I crawl in, I crawl inside, and I track him out. I said, I'm getting, you know. And then the medic. Who was way one of the vehicles way down ran through all that automatic weapons fire to come and treat me. Right? So uh, it turns out that my f closest friend in the platoon got killed that morning. Uh, three of us were wounded, and, and he got killed. I was put on a medevac helicopter. His body was in a body bag at my feet. So I mean, that, that, that's a tough. May yes. seven, May seventh, sixty eight is a tough one for me, and then it's seared and then, into your mind. And yeah. then, and then, there, and then uh, another thing that I find out that we dedicated the Illinois Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Springfield on the seventh of May, nineteen eighty eight. That's twenty years to the, to the date. date. Yeah. Right. Then I found out that the battle at DMB and Fu, DMB and Fu fell to the, fell to Ho Chi Minh in on the seventh of May, nineteen fifty four. I mean, ironic. Yeah. Ironic. Truly ironic. That's what you said to say about the Vietnam. There's these mysterious connections, or. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, I, I mean, I saw enough. I mean, you know, yeah, so not, that we, not that we lost a lot of people killed in the platoon at the time, but I mean, it's. Uh, but you took that 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 serious shrapnel. That was during the Tet Offensive. Yeah. Yeah. Both and both of them. Both all of them were. All of them were. Yeah. When they met at you, they lived you to back to a hospital in Saigon or some other place. Took, took me to the 12th and Vac Hospital in Coochie, and the, they treated me at the 12th and Vac to Coochie, put me on an airplane. Got on, I got on an airplane and flew to flew to uh, Tainan Base Camp to my flew my base camp. Then I was, you know, then then when I had to do anything else was through my medics or I had to go to the 41st, 45th Surgical Hospital. That was, you know. And did you return to combat after that? No. No, I mean, I spent the. Uh, from the 7th of May, 1968, until the 6th of July, which was the day after my birthday, in shower shoes, I didn't have to do any duty. You know, didn't have to have, they had me doing charge of quarters one night, and I had to go to the aid station on how many times get the dress because it kept draining. You know, and then medics were up, no, no, no duty, no, no boots or anything. So I was like that for two months, and the day after, the day after my birthday, I put boots on and went back to regular duty. And then it was like, uh, and then it was only six more days and. I was I was out. I was gone. The uh, and then you also received the um, a series of medals here. Run wound medal. Vietnamese. I, I oh, it's RVN. I, I'm I sorry. Yeah, RVN. It's RVN Republic. And then you got Vietnam. the RVN Gallantry Cross. And then the RVN Service Medal. And then the the campaign medal were four four campaign stars. QVN campaign. Yeah. Did you serve with? Um, did you have? Uh, the opportunity to see that you must have. I mean, but the the regular Vietnamese soldiers, the armies of the South, were they pretty good soldiers? And well, I mean, this this is a we had two in our platoon. They were interpreters. Okay. The I'm going to give you the the observations and the opinions of the majority of Vietnam veterans. Right, that the South Vietnamese military was 100% totally worthless. Okay, we really didn't work with them, but. That's the consensus type of thing, not the we're not in not in reality. Okay, not in reality. And as as I consume reading materials since the parade in 1986 that we had in Chicago, and I mean I can probably consume everything you have near in a library plus, you know, and uh, my whole opinion changed. And then I got to know them. And I mean, not a lot. You know, I I probably. Got more friendly with ex ex South Vietnamese military here that live in Chicago and, and, and a lot of veterans that you know. Wow. It's like I had that there was a connection. I mean, I had made a made a, a speech un, unprepared. You know, I, unprepared. You had a you had a you had a, I mean, make this speech and it was something that we were letting balloons go for prisoner of war and I make this speech. And I, it caught me totally. Caught me. So everything was just freewheeled out of my head and. Uh, you know, the one guy there over there says, he says you really, what you said really grabbed them by the heart because, I mean, it's like, you know, 
we were talking about Ho Chi Minh City, and I didn't know Ho Chi Minh City. I only knew Saigon. You know, it was the you know it was the Republic of Vietnam, Vietnam Cong Hoa. You know, that's Vietnam Cong Hoa is Republic of Viet uh, Republic of Vietnam in Vietnamese. And uh, you know, so, so I mean, uh, yeah, I have. I buried I buried that I buried that X. You know, and then yeah. buried that what's crawling around under your skin for for twenty and thirty years. I buried that and buried that in the eighties. Yeah. Any Australian soldiers you saw when you were out there? Huh? Any Australian soldiers that saw? Oh yeah, you know, the Australians could really put put the beard on. Remember? Yeah, when I was going on R and R, yeah, or there was some guy was trying some U.S. soldier was trying to keep up drinking with the Aussies in his in his club. Yeah, it never happened. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's re it's really funny. I mean, that's just there's. I mean, I go on. You know, I. It's, I'm doing this interview, and, and, and there's a lot of things. There's a lot. I mean, how do I put this? Vietnam is in my skin. It's in my mind. Everything is like it happened an hour ago, and it's all in color by Technicolor. I mean, I can read. Uh, uh, I ran across Tropic Lightning newspapers. I had a couple. One. I'm reading this this article about this about this. This, this fight, and I thought it was Ap Long Mook when I, where I got wounded, but Ap Long Mook was the 25th of, really was the 25th, so my hat, my purple heart has, you know, has, has it on there, I've had an embroidered on there, but it was, I just freed it the other day, and it, was, it was some other, where, where, where uh, this infantry unit got airlifted into this village, and the NVA, the North Vietnamese, NVA, North Vietnamese regular army was dug in, and they were, we got called to support, support them with our, with our armor. And I can remember, I can remember off to my left, off to my left, the infantry was pinned down, right? And I took my mic and told my track commander, let's go, let's go get these guys out here. So I pulled my, I drove my APC over, drove my our APC over there, put it broadside to the village, which was stupid because we could have taken RPGs right in, right in, right in the side, dropped the ramp, got these guys out here with the, with the wounded. I mean, I can, I can remember backing out. You got to be proud of that moment. I can remember backing out. I can remember. I can remember sitting there at night. This stuff is going on all night long, all night long, and the, the jets are bombing, it's bombing it, and they're coming in, they're strafing with the 20 millimeter can. They're coming in like they're strafing, and the NVA shooting back up at them with the 51 caliber machine guns. I mean, I, I can see this in color, like yeah. right color. When you say APC, that stands for armor. Armor personnel carrier. Armor personnel carrier. But our armor personnel carriers were a little different. And you had the armor personnel carrier, and and we had, because it was a scout platoon, for one thing, and that happened a lot. They, they added the stuff they called, they called it an ACAV kit, okay? So they turned a regular armored personnel carrier into an armored cab assault vehicle that mounted three machine guns, two M60 machine guns in the back and a 50 caliber. So our platoon was, you know, 10 of these things, you know. Otherwise, most of your mechanized infantry was just a, the 50 caliber machine gun, you know, and yeah. infantry rode on it. So that's APC, but you know, in 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 theory, my my platoon was an ACAF, but it was an APC ACAF. Did um, while you were there under all these situations of uh, of stress and danger and inconceivable uh, experiences, um, did you get some leave or some R and R? Well, I took R and R. I took R and R. I took R and R in December, and I went to Bangkok. It was Skip from Alpha Company. Oh, he could come. Hey, I was talking about. So I thought I'd go and go to Bangkok on R and R. Came back and went, and, and then we were two of us were talking in the field. So we went, not knowing that we could get leave. Okay, so we went back. But that was it. You got you got a, a five day, five day out of country R and R or a three day in country at Vung Tau on uh, South, South China Sea. That was it. In your old, you know, in your period of time there, 13 months for Marines, 12 months for Army. I haven't heard. It's the three-day... Uh, In-country r and In-country r and yeah, so a very the, nice place. There's a, well, it's, a, it's, on, it's on the South China Sea. It's a beach, beach and had bars and everything on the South China Sea. There's, there's somewhere near the Saigon area. Did uh, um, did any famous entertainers or USO... I only saw I only saw Connie Francis. Oh. But she's Connie Francis was at the, she was at Tain and I didn't see Bob Hope. I didn't see Bob Hope. Yeah. Yeah, I mean a lot. You have you know you had a lot. You had Bob Hope, Raquel Welch, and Joey Heatherton, and you know how this how the, the whole smear went. You know, but uh, yeah, we saw some of that on on television back here. Yeah, yeah. when well, I saw I only saw Connie Francis in in person. Yeah, so um, uh, were there any kind of 
not sure to answer. Were there any humorous events? No, not too much. No, it's pretty. Good. I know. I have to. I have to think because some of some bizarre stuff is when you look back. It be it could be kind of humorous, but it really wasn't. No. I mean, for for instance, when we had this this action and we assaulted this area at night, and it was basketball players floating over, and in a tank pulls up. There's a there's a bunch of equipment. All right, so I got off there with the medic, and we're over, and it was all their NVA their packs, right? So. so I'm handing this stuff up in their hands, and then, then, then they yell, then they yell, you know, the soldiers down there, and they, they pull out, left me out there by myself, and I hit the ground. I had an M79 grenade launcher. I had a buckshot round in there. Saw the little silhouettes. So later, later that, like five in the morning, five in the morning, <laughs> this guy that ended up being a gunner on my last, my last day camp, says, "Let's go see if we can find more equipment." Right? And so we're out there, we're out in this area, but flashlights with the red red lens to diffuse it and we're picking up all this all this equipment. There was a hole on reaching out trying to get the AK magazines out there. My buddy Tom I says, Hey, get the there's get that get, go go down there and get this stuff out of what if there's a so what if there's a you know, I'm gonna use the term so what if there's a gook in there, right? Yeah. I yeah there's nothing. I was halfway in there. I give my forty five it was on hole. It was a hand grenade. It was a live guy in the hole. And I mean, I was half down, and so I just couldn't reach it. I mean, and live guy in his live guy in his hole, and he got took a hand grenade, and got met, and then, then he came out to surrender, and one of the tankers shot up one of his fingers up with a 45. I mean, that's a strange thing that when you look at how a humorous thing, you go, oh, yeah, nothing ever. Yeah, it's he funny. And he went like, down into a hole, and there was already a, yeah, an enemy soldier down there. Yeah. And a grenade went off? He threw a grenade. He threw a grenade. He threw a grenade. He threw a grenade. He threw a driver, uh, uh, another guy from my... First armor person. This is the strangest thing. My second armor personnel carrier. We we flipped. He was a. I, I was driving, and then I had to flip because I couldn't hear anymore because of the 50 caliber machine gun. Here's right over your head, right? And he flipped, and then he went down in the tunnel after this action. There's an explosion. We pulled him out of the tunnel. It looked like a lawnmower ran over his face. Well, what had happened? He crawled in the tunnel, and the North Vietnamese soldier crawled around the tunnel and shot him. He shot, shot him, and he threw a hand grenade. So we pulled him out of there. We, we pulled him out of there, and he got medevac. And then another guy from platoon, we had uh, a battery of 105 artillery fall right on the platoon. He ended up getting wounded, getting castrated. So the two of them were in the two of them were at the 12th of vac in the 50-50 ward at 12th of vac. So we went to see him. You know, we went to see him. We went to Gucci, went and Gucci went to see him. And we and Steve nudged. There was a track. He, he nudges nudges Mark. And he says, uh, "How you doing?" Right now, everybody, everybody thinks they're so tough. And all. I mean, I saw people that were tough. The kid goes, "I'll be back in the field in a couple of days." Are you kidding me? I mean, to me, that's one of was one of the bravest people I ever met in my life. Yeah. And then it turns out that Steve got Steve lost a leg on a leg. leg. They ran over an anti tank mine, lost a leg. Yeah. And, and and the strange things are, and I had mentioned about the about the first February 29th when you know we took the rocket propeller. I joined this platoon. We had a there was somebody killed on that. We had to clean all the blood off. We went out and support the support in the afternoon, and we were following a tank across this dry stream. And we came around the tank like this. We took two rocket propeller grenades, you know, put set the thing on fire. We we got off it. Right, the driver was the first one off. Two years ago. I'm on the internet. I'm just surfing through, scrolling through the internet. I think Pops says this about old cars in Vietnam, right? Old cars. I'll open up. It's interesting. Some kid that was in Michigan had a 56 T Bird when he, went to, when he went to Vietnam, right? Turns out he's talking about this action that took place in, in February, February 29th. So I son, like this, popped him off an email. I said, I seem to remember to be something, but the circumstances were a little bit different. Well, yeah. That was the driver, that, that armor personnel here, that him. I didn't even know his name. I, did, I did, just met him that day that I joined, never even knew his name. And yet he sends me an email back and says, if I remember right, you offered to drive for me that day. How life yeah. works in strange ways. Yeah. That scene you articulated before about the Vietnam experience, yeah. So, uh, Marty, you were sh you were shot at, you were shelled, you were, and you were also in combat. You shot back too. Um, I was in combat, yeah. And, and yeah. I'll be perfectly honest with you, Neil. 
or perfectly honest, whoever sees the sniper. I only am positive that I killed two people. In a firefight, there are hundreds of rounds flying back and forth both ways. If you kill someone, if you happen to kill somebody, you might, you, you really didn't know. I yeah. mean, to me it was, to me it was a, a thing that, you know, maybe stretching 15 feet, so I mean, I, I, and I don't, I don't dwell on it. It doesn't eat me alive. I was, I was a little older when I was there because I turned 24 when I was there. And I wasn't a 19 year old kid. It, it doesn't eat me alive, but I also understand the fact that that when, when we saw the bodies the next day, they were trying to kill us with a hand grenade. So. Yeah, yeah. So, Marty, this, um, um, the rank that you attained, uh, Specialist 4. In other words, in essence, with the same, same equivalent rank as a corporal. And where did you receive that promotion? In, in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Yeah. In the, was, it, uh, was that as a result of... Uh, no, it's just a... Uh, time to move up? Or time to move up. But what really made it bad when they when they did that the division at that period of time, if you if you had X amount of time in in the military, right, and X amount of time in grade, you could have got promoted to an E5, which is a buck sergeant, right? Well, it turns out I had X amount of time in the military. I was I was I was three months short of of, of getting out of out, but I only had two months not the foreign grade, so I couldn't even I couldn't even get that, that other promotion to move up another rank. Yeah, the um, so your last uh, couple of months in, in in Vietnam, then you were recovering from the from yeah, obviously, from the injury. obviously, yeah. That's, so you were looking forward to to your to being discharged then. Well, obviously, or everybody's looking. Everybody's got a figmo. A figmo is a little calendar that you count down, count down the day from whatever it is, seventy to day one or ninety to day yeah. one. Figo means farewell. I've got my orders, so you so you're blacking out the dates down to one. My Figmo happened to be some used to be some you know raunchy ones. My Figmo happened to be a turtle. Yeah. You know, you're scratching off, so you're just scratching the days off. No. And um, so there was most most of the uh, speaking for yourself and most of the soldiers you knew. Uh, it was few a few people re-enlisted or re-upped. Yeah, say? I don't, I don't think it there. Uh, you no, know, even my track commander, who was who was a lifer, okay, he, he had six years or nine years. Says, so when this hits, he's not going to reenlist again. And the strangest thing about that, that there was a another NCO in my platoon that was on that that very first APC. All right, he went back to the states. He was sent back to he was sent back to Vietnam for another tour. He ends up in the same company in the same platoon in 1969. I mean that's like bizarre. Yeah, yeah. And I give you bizarre when you you've been over here, Roger, right? Served with the 25th Infantry Division, 65 and 66. I was there 67, 68. Carlos Carlos Saladino mm -hmm. was there in 69. Well, Carlos yeah, Saladino got he got he almost lost a leg. The little Oriental doctor saved his leg. I mean, uh, and he came back from Japan, and he was, you know, he was airborne qualified. He was a paratrooper, but he was was with a straight leg infantry unit. And uh, they were going to see. Thought he was going to go back to the, the 27th Infantry. They said, oh, "You're airborne qualified." They sent him. They sent him to the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Now he gets up. To, he gets up the bonk LZ uplift, and. Uh, He's looking for Sergeant Andres. I'm sure that, and Johnny's part of the coffee thing too. And he's looking from one bunker to bunker, and, and Johnny was was short, right? And with Sergeant Andres in there, he says he was in the corner with a blanket over. Said, "I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going." But this this larger percentage of these people that we get together for coffee, they grew up in the same neighborhood. They're all from the same neighborhood. Johnny and Carlos and Roger, same church, same neighborhood. Yeah, it's, like, it's crazy. I'm the one. I'm the one. That even Mickey, even Mickey, Mickey, and, and Dennis. You know, and people from Morgan Grove. Me, I'm 100 percent I fall here. So the um, so then you flew back from Saigon on on Pan Am. Yeah, Pan Am. And you get back to 
Oakland, Oakland Army Base in California and got back and the first thing you get when you get back like that, you got the big steak dinner with steak and steak and fries and everything and all that was your, your, your well, welcome back dinner and you just hung, we just waited until you process out, you know, up there. And then you take the train back to Chicago? No, and I went to, I went to San Francisco Airport and flew. But the thing is, I went out to San Francisco Airport, probably going out to the airport like 5 o'clock San Francisco time. It was July. It was 50-something degrees. Oh, that was quite a change. Got on the plane. Got off the plane at O'Hare. 10 o'clock at night, it was 85 degrees. I mean, yeah. that's, that's just, 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 if you've never been to, to San Francisco, that's just the way it is in the Bay. I mean, you don't see sun out there until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, when you got off the plane, were you able to walk uh, normally? And oh, yeah. Yeah. And then... Uh, so when you get back to Chicago, then did you have any trouble readjusting to civilian life, or were you able to get your old well, job I took back? Two, I took two, I took two, two weeks off, two weeks off. Uh, I didn't want to go back to being an auto mechanic, and when I was on leave from being a military, I used to work at this liquor distributor in a warehouse. So I went, I went, I went, I went, went Went back. I was working. I went back. I was working there prior. I mean, I got a job there, and that's, that's where I was working when I got married. That's after the first six months of marriage, because I was working. I, I was coming home at seven in the morning. My wife was leaving for work. You know, it made it difficult. So I went back into auto mechanics. Yeah. I mean, other than the, to adjust, the point was the point. The point there was about Vietnam as. Uh, I understand all the thing about people coming back and being harassed at the airport and being spit on. It, in my case, it didn't happen. But then again, nobody asked you anything about anything. So yeah. you had that. Other than me, uh, I never really told my mother. But other than me talking with my mm -hmm. my girlfriend, who became my parent, my wife, and even she didn't to get all of it. You know, the all of it started coming out after the, the welcome home parade here in '86. You know, so that welcome home parade in Chicago in 1986, that was important, uh, was important experience for, for Vietnam veterans, yeah. Well, it's really funny because, uh, you know, I didn't even know. I was on, I was at a, a postal bowling tournament in, in Buffalo, New York, and uh, we drove back, and there was a, you know, the, the stuff for the girls' softball league, the bats and all that, it was in a bag, and thinking about the parade. Yeah, he's going to go, yes, oh, we're going to go. That's a couple other, you know, Vietnam veterans here, here, here in, in Niles. So we went down to the parade. I had no idea, and that was like that was the first time I saw the half scale wall, and it grabbed your heart. So I got involved. I went to Washington in '86 D.C. for to the wall, which is like ruining me. It, it's how do I explain it? The wall's in a V, and you walk down to the V. Have you, have you been to the wall? No, no. The wall's in the shape of a V, like this. It's black granite. And you walk the highest down, where the, the, the wall gets taller as you go down, right? You're down to the V. Well, I had to walk down to the V, and already by the time I got down to the base of the, to, to, to the access point, the access there, it's rolling down my face. But I had to walk all the way, almost all the way to the other end for my buddy Bob. Bob. So it, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I can't think of the word. You know, it's it, you because you you as a civilian can maybe re maybe really understand it. Me as a veteran, it's the granite is so highly polished. My reflection is part of the wall. So every time I go there, I'm a blithering idiot, and I've been to the wall three times. You know, and I've left stuff at the wall. The last time I didn't, I went with my. I went with my son like my son law to the wall in December, but I mean I've gone there, you know, I've gone there in, in the summertime. I've left I've left stuff at the wall. I mean, I had a letter in a frame, I left that left that at the wall. The um the gentleman who was reported to have been killed, and then that's when you decided that you would go into recon. Oh yeah. That gentleman I only saw Later, you found out that he did. He yeah, I only saw Skip once, once after Vietnam. Oh. He was from Detroit. Never got his address. So they called. He called. He called me up. He came down to Chicago. Came down with two of his college, two of his his Fred's fraternity brothers. You know, we went out drinking. So yeah. But I mean, I don't you know try to to run him down. I mean, that's 
Yeah, so that's one of the questions they have is, did, were you, um, <coughs> excuse me, did you stay in contact with any of your wartime buddies after the service? Well, I didn't stay in contact. Ironically, things, strange things happen. Like, it's just the whole thing is, is, a, is a strange thing. The parade in 1986, I was on a, it might have been the problem. I was on a, in a hotel on Michigan Avenue, and I'm on an escalator going down. The two guys get off the escalator at the base, and I look, and I get down, then about near the center, I said, Sparvini, and the kid turns around, right? We're in the same platoon. Turns out the other guy, Wayne, was in this, who was in this, he was in that platoon with Farvini before I joined it. Wayne got medevaced in November of 67, you know, at, well, his face really got screwed up. So that was two people from my company that lived in Chicago that I didn't even know their addresses or anything, right? And then, and then the, then the medic, the, the Japanese medic who was looking for Farvini, but lives in Schaumburg. In '79, now we go, we go, th we used to go to the Summerfest in, in Milwaukee. I said, well, geez, you know, Roman Marzik is is with with. I think he's from Milwaukee. I look up my phone book. There were two Marzik's in there. Yeah, I mean, that was a gunner on my last day cab. I, you know, went over to his house and you know, spent an afternoon, you know, spent an afternoon. Got there, saw photographs and what have you. And uh, in 1990, my track commander, uh, they had started a battalion association, and uh, I, I found this photograph. His name pops up on the list you know, that I got from him. I found this photograph. So I dropped it on the whole table. I said, I don't know if this is you. And it turns out it was my track commander. He was traveling, came down with his wife, wife, wife and daughter, and spent you know through more. I forgot where. I forgot where he stayed in a hotel or Niles, and they spent spent a few you know spent a few days here. I mean. I mean, other than the fact that I had a, 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 uh, one of the guys that, that knew me from Vietnam called, and another guy called me on a Sunday after the, uh, they had the first battalion reunion, but uh, I couldn't go because the week later we had the, the 25th Division's Convention here in Chicago, and uh, the guy called me up and he says, uh, and he says, uh, yeah, this is Ed Hunt, he says, uh, I don't know if you remember me, he says, but I went with you one night and I learned to love the earth. And I says, and that's the night that I shot the 2NVA. That was the medic that, that came and treated me. He called me from California. I mean, it's just, I mean, all in all, I was just, it, it's weird. I, pr I probably, what people really don't know, I think, I think Illinois had either the third or fourth highest number of people that served in Vietnam. Wow. Did you um, did you join any veterans organizations or anything like? That? Well, you know, I mean, I had uncles that served in World War II, and you know, it's uh, uh, well, you can't join the VFW. That wasn't a war. You know, I've heard that. Um, it wasn't a war. You can't. You can't remember. It wasn't a war. So I mean, I did not join the VFW. I did not join the American Legion. Of course, the American Legion, as I found out later, was a little more lenient. But then again, as as the veterans aged. You know, you have no new blood unless you, unless we're going to say, this organization is stricter for Vietnam veterans. You have everybody from Iraq and Afghanistan, all of that, you know, you're not going to let them join because they weren't in Vietnam. It's going to, it's going to just yeah. eliminate itself. So I'm basically, basically that's, they got a little more liberal after, after 86, but by that time, you already had, a, you already had a kind of a, a, a bad taste in your mouth of, of joining somebody who snubbed you when you could have used some support. Yeah. Um, by by serving in the army then um, in the late sixties, was the GI Bill still in effect then? GI Bill was only good for ten years. Only good for ten. That years. GI Bill was only good for ten years. World War Two was good for good, good for, or I think good for life. Yeah. You never made. It, you didn't. I didn't go back to school or anything. On GI Bill. I had ten years. I didn't even, didn't even use anything to get a uh, a loan or anything to buy a home. I didn't, didn't didn't go that way. Didn't go that way. Didn't use it. Probably, probably a, a mistake on my part. I mean, people came back. They went to they went to college. Well, you know, I didn't go to college. I didn't go to college. I went to one semester of college. I'm not, I'm not a college educated individual, but I, I'm far from being, a, I'm far from being a literate individual. Yes, sir. Um, I sense that we're coming to the, um, the end of the formal conversation here, as it's outlined, um, and there's, uh, there's always two questions that we ask. That um, how do you think your service uh, and your experiences uh, in the military affected your life? I think you've already talked about that a little bit. 
I, uh, I abhor war. I don't feel that we should get involved, you know, we should get involved in, in, in some aspect of, I thought that Iraq was a mistake. Yeah, go after bin Laden because of what happened in, at the towers in New York. Yes, but when you had a chance to get him, you start you start a war with somebody that was unnecessary, which was a uh, loss of American lives, American youth, a loss of a heck of a lot of money. You know what do you want to call it? Treasure that was referred to as that. You don't just you don't just burn up. You know you, you don't just burn up people. I mean, you had your your people who protested the. Vietnam War are the ones that are in Congress, you know, the ones that are, are all your CEOs now and, and, and all, the, all your wealthy people in, Cong in Congress and, and even in the White House. You know. I don't want to say he protested even ago, but you know, you know, neither did, well, Obama, you know, wasn't at that age, but Clinton didn't either. I mean, ironically, I, I, I had a t-shirt that I bought way back then, you know, and I was going through this bunch of t-shirts that I, I, I put aside for rags. It was a t-shirt that was brand new. I never even wore it. The t-shirt says, says there's a picture of the White House on there and the, and the POW thing and the t-shirt says only in America can a veteran sleep in a cardboard box while a draft dodger sleeps in the White House. And yet that was referring to Clinton. It's also apropos to Mr. Trump. So how do, how did it change uh, my 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 thoughts and my theories? I mean, that's uh, I can't. Res you have to earn my respect. I can't just give you my respect. You know. I, yeah. The the other question I think you probably answered this is how do you think your uh, your military experience uh, your military experience uh, influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, the military should have. There should be a draft. Everybody, everybody should be compelled to do some form of service to their country. When they did away with the draft because of of everybody not wanting, want, they didn't want to die in Vietnam. They didn't want to do anything. I mean, it's, it all it was was you know let's party and let's party and, and drugs and what and what have you at that period of time in this country. I mean, you should be compelled to, yeah. to some service to your country. You know that war. Yeah, I'm. It's got to. This has to really has to be a reason, reason to go. Guns. I mean, people are fascinated with all this gun buying guns. All this. You know, I have not picked up. I have not picked up a gun or fired a gun since 1968. I want nothing to do with them. Um, Marty, when did you move to Niles? 1978. 1978. Um, so here at the Niles Library, we have that veterans, uh, those veterans walk white benches. Yeah, I know. I was part of the organization that put those benches on here. You know, Veterans of America, Chapter 311. It was based in Niles. In fact, I started it after the parade in '86. Of course, we went on along that, and 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 in, in lieu of doing the community thing, or trying to help other veterans who were, you know, get get over or get past, or, or people are struggling. They turn into this. I'm here. Oh, what can I get for me? What I want to. What can I get? What can I get for some politician? What can I get for me? Because it really did happen with with an alderman in Chicago that was was a veteran that was a lot of us. He came the liaison at daily and became an alderman. You know. So they saw this and it was like, I wasn't I wasn't with this stuff. So I wasn't in their their case to kind of. They kind of made it hard, and they, they kind of ran me ran me out. Okay, after starting this, they kind of ran me out. Okay, is, well, that, is that organization still going? Yeah, yeah. But they moved to the Plains. First, they moved to Park Ridge because Niles never did anything. Niles never did. Niles never did anything for them. Was what they said. But I, I mean, I happened to go see John or whatever, and when he had the, uh, I don't know if it was the, where the bank is on Oakton. Where the bank is on Oakton Street. There used to be a. a, a Community building over there, you know. He allowed us to have meetings there, which he loved place to, you know, have meetings. You know, I just sound like they can't. They could never tell me that Niles didn't do it. So they just they they just moved on. Okay, they just moved on, and uh, I wash my hands of organizations. You know, even what even the guys I have coffee with, you know, in Chapter 242, and it's like, you know, you know, we'll get you, we'll get you, we'll get you. To, you get me to join. 
you're not going to get me drunk. I used to, I used to, I don't know, a good six years, I used to, every Veterans Day used to be up in Gulf Mill with a display from Vietnam. I don't know if you ever were ever up there on Veterans Day. No, I'm usually at the, I just go to you know, Waterfall. Yeah. It used to be up until they got, until they made it too uh, outrageous that they wanted a uh, hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars of insurance to put this, you know, we couldn't afford it, you know. Started a uh, educational organization. It was, it was called the Vietnam Veterans Educational Program. It's non-existent now. But we used to go to high schools in the, in the spring. You know, I mean, I worked for the post office. I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know how many days off I gave up. You know, the overtime money. How many days I gave up to go to go to go to high schools? I mean, you know, go. To, I mean, we were, we were, you know, Westing out high school in the city where the, where, the, where the kids were sleeping on the desk. I mean, to see stuff like this is like go to schools and, and talk about it and talk about talk about talk about it. We even incorporated. We were literally incorporated in the state of Illinois. You know, and then one one vet in the organization says, well, if you get any money, who's going to have control of it? Wait a minute. Chapter 311, some guy in chapter 3 wants to have control of the money that is, in, in an, you know, that's, that was never going to happen. So it was their thoughts at the time. But I also realize even, even now that they're not teaching this in school. Or not teaching. I, I'd be, I, I haven't seen a textbook, but I'd be lucky if you could, you'd be lucky if you could find a chapter about Vietnam in a textbook, high school textbook. They're not teaching it. It's, it's. Uh, we're doing this for the Library of Congress. It'll be here. It'll be here for, in eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, whatever you keep here in the library, it'll be here for eternity and all of that. Uh, with me doing all of this stuff, like I have these photographs and. And, and downloading all of this stuff for five years off the internet, off the internet, and you know, clean. I have to really go through them and, and get rid of the duplicates and really clean the photographs mm -hmm. up where they're, they're they're clear. I want to leave. I want to leave something. I want to leave something for my. I want to leave something for my my grandson. All the stuff that I had from Vietnam, other than <coughs> my uniform. You know, I even sold my own. I even sold my own uniform. I had collected all that stuff. I sold the stuff, and all I had left was uh, my medals. My medals and. Uh, to pay on my Vietnamese money. Well, I finished all that off. Where I have the 20 years of the 20 years of the Republic of Vietnam. I have all all the short three bills that have original paper money. All the coins. I had the same thing with Laos and Cambodia. We were in, involved in both. So as I plot along, I said, "Oh, what are these coins?" And I got some tokens right, and it's like they're, they were slot machine tokens. You know that were used in club in, in the clubs, the units clubs in Vietnam, right? So I had about eight of them. Well, I've been dabbling in this for a year. I got over 300 of them now. Wow, and I picked this, this three ring binder up. It's like, you know, I mean, I have to, I have to split these up and put this in a, in a second three ring. I want to leave this for my grandson. I mean, it's yeah. How old is your grandson? Two. Two. You got a little time. And uh, yeah, but I don't. He's, he's he's got a long time, but I don't. You know, I'm I'm astute enough to know that you know when you hit 73, which I will be next month, you're on borrow time. It may be next year. It may be ten years from now. Maybe twenty years. It's still borrowed time. Yeah. And I started beside beside did all this. Now I go and compound everything else. That's why I can't get back into pictures. I started compiling music Vietnam. Right. Some of it is rock music from from that area from that era. Okay. But there was so much stuff that was music, even when it was rock or country about Vietnam and about the war and about the protests, da, 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 da. then you got into the, the other aspect of it after the 80s, where it was the veterans talking about Agent Orange and post-traumatic stress and and, and, da, da, da. and we get to the wall. You start hearing the music about the wall. So I did six CDs, gave, gave Roger, I, you know, I, I handed out three of them, three, three, three CDs. Then I did. A, then I did. I, then I did another one for. They have some uh, silent raffle at this dinner. I added and I had to add another one. That's more strictly seven ones about the wall. There was 175 songs about about this in there. I can just do it all over again, Neil. You know? I got another 75 to add to this 175. And I look at this stuff and, and it's like, my God. And then I see this thing called the Vietnam Experience. You know, I guess the Vietnam Experience. Whatever. This was Vietnam. Next stop, Vietnam. Somebody in Germany did this, you know, with speeches and all that from the time. It's like 13 CDs. 
four hundred dollars for the thirteen CDs, and I mean, I do this for best and give it away. I mean, it's like, you know. And um, I mean, if, I, this, so this, Ken, this Ken Burns um, series is coming out this fall on Vietnam. That'll probably generate. Yeah, you you uh, never know. It's some more interest. Yeah. You never know. I mean, that's, that's uh, if I ever get to ever get a chance to to get this, you know. Music put together, I will ensure that the library gets a copy of these CDs. Thank you. That I'll give them to you, and whether you keep them for yourself or give them to the library, ensure that this music is part of history. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful that you're participating in this project because uh, it's the same thing. Its with mission the is the goal is the, is the same as yours. Same thing with the photographs. Yeah. Sure. If I ever if I ever uh, ever get around to getting this stuff straightened out, that would be on CDs. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can print, but I mean, I'm going to print. 4,000 photographs, I mean, which will deteriorate over, over, over yeah. years anyway. Yeah. Um, Marty, the, the, the missing in action flag that's out, that they fly here at the Niles Library. For the, uh, fly, fly at the village too, it flies at all. Yeah, are you responsible for, for that in any way? No. No, that was, uh, that, the first time you really saw the POW MIA stuff was at the parade in 86. You know, here. I mean, probably in Chicago, and I just got that one where it's kind of like it's almost like a government thing now that they have to fly it. You know, the PO, the BLW flag. Oh, it, 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 emanated, it emanated from it emanated from uh, that period of time. You know, in the 80s, uh, there was a, a woman we know. Her husband was special forces. That I mean, just, if you want to, no, we're good. If you want to ball it afterward, it's yeah. fine too. Her husband was special forces that was missing in action, and uh, maybe four years ago, four years ago, and we're talking forty something years, she found out, finally found out what really happened to him. They were she was in a, in a in a in a FAC aircraft, and it was it was shot down in Laos where we weren't supposed to be, right? But it was highly sensitive stuff, so they bombed the site where the, they bombed the site where the, the plane went down. She never knew what happened to her husband. When you say uh, FAC, four air controller, four air controller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned co collecting those uh, tokens, tokens in Laos and Cambodia. Did, did no, I got the coins. I got coins. The, I got Were the, you in Laos and Cambodia no, also? No, no, I wasn't. No, yeah. but it's like, you know, I know where I picked them up over the years. You know, a few. It's like, you know, you go and you go on, you go on the internet and you find the stuff to fill it because, you know, like Laos was only. Those Laos was only three coins, three coins for 20 years. They produced about paper money, and uh, Cambodia was, you know, two sets of threes, two different, you know, two different years. I don't have the 53s; I got the 59s. The paper money is like, you know, that's 53 all the way to 74. I think is the the coins uh, that I have for Vietnam. I think one day I'll, one day I should just. Just come over, Neil. Why don't look at the stuff? And yeah, and it's. it's uh, I've been a you know I've been a librarian for I don't know 42 years, but this uh, working on this veterans history project is the, the best thing I've ever uh, had the privilege of. Uh, well, you got you, you need to get more people, on. more people to, uh, you know. It's just the transcribing that slows me down. I have the desire to, to talk about this. I mean, yeah. it's you know. Yeah. Um, is there anything, Marty, that you would like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? No, I mean, uh, we kind of, kind of got. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna look like hell on this video because I'm fidgeting all over. No, no, you're, you're you terrific. Know, it's, uh, I, I, we covered going in. We covered the uh, basic. We covered the AIT. We covered, we covered now. We covered, we covered coming home. Uh, the parade, uh, which you know. Give you part of the aftermath. I have to refer to everything post Vietnam as the aftermath because the aftermath was the people that buried it inside, buried it inside, and couldn't express it. The post traumatic stress that they dealt with, the Agent Orange exposure to Agent Orange, the alcoholism, the drug abuse, the suicide. You know, I mean, you talk about suicide with the People coming out of out of out of the middle out of the Middle East. I mean, way back then we had well over a hundred thousand 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 people kill themselves. You know, and, uh, that's yeah, that su um, veteran suicide. That was a great issue of um, Mr. Amarati's. He yeah. was always uh, yeah. I knew Tom. Tom was a friend. Yeah, Tom was a friend. I mean, when Tom went in for a surgery, he went in for a, just to show what happened. At, I 
I mean, I went in for surgery on my spine on a mon Monday. And uh, Tom stopped at the hospital on Tuesday. After the coffee, they said the guys got together some old big, a big box of donuts, right? So I took one. I was going home the next day. I took one to have my wife take it down to the nurse station of donuts, right? Tom went into the hospital on Friday for that second of the same a repetition, repetition of the heart surgery they had prior and never came out. He was on life support, never came out. Never saw him again. And I met him in '86. As a result of the right, parade. yeah. So that's if you're so if if you're living in Chicago and you want want to understand the Vietnam experience, particularly as it was lived uh, and, uh, by the veterans, you, you, that 1986 parade is really important. The '86 parade, yeah. yeah. The '86, the 1986 parade here in Chicago. I'm sure there were, Roger went to one in New York first, but I mean that was important. Important was also the dedication of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Springfield. We, we participated in that parade. I participated in that parade there too. That was, you know, that that, that was important. The wall is probably the most important thing. Uh, if they um, some of the the honor flights from Chicago. Uh, I think they're beginning to, they'll soon be moving. Yeah, well, to Tom, Tom Adams and Lewis and Morton Grove, it's, it, that's a funny story, Tom Adams. I mean, I've known Roger since, since 86 and Carlos and Carlos and Johnny since 87. I'm sitting there one day and Tom Adams says, uh, yeah, Tom Adams, he says, I says, you used to be a water mechanic? <laughs> oh. He says, yeah, he says, I used to work with you. At Dave Corey Ford in 1977 over here by the Leaning Tower. Was where the Ford dealer was. He did an honor flight, but he had to go out to Mitchell Field in, in Milwaukee. Oh. You know, he said, you got to go and all of that. You know, he, yeah, you know, let somebody else who's never been to the wall go on the honor, you know, go on honor flight. Now, yeah, i got to go to the wall. I mean, I have to go again. You know, it, it's a must. It's a must before I die. I just wish the, the hell that... I could get the people that I serve with in the same platoon. Let's all meet at, in Washington. Let's meet at the wall. I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, I went to, when I talked to the kid in Milwaukee, he, you know, I said, yeah, these photographs? He says, I don't have any photographs. I said, oh, I was at your house. We were looking at slides. He says, Karen, do I have photographs? So he just told to show me that Alzheimer's, yeah. he's, he's, he, he's going. I mean, he's my age. He's going, right? Yeah. And my track commander was always down there in 1990. He was in, in Pulaski, New York, and he's, you know, a little physically physically down, too. I mean, talk to him on the phone, but it's like, you know, I'd like to see some of these people before we're, you know, before we're all, we're all uh, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Yeah. And I went, I went to, and I went to, certainly, we had a reunion, we had a reunion here in Chicago, and it, and being the fact that it was the post office, I, we had to pick our vacations in December for the next year. So they, if they decided that they're going to have they're going to have this reunion in, in Branson, Missouri, they 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 send the stuff out in February. My vacations picked, you know. So I missed all of the, all of these all of these reunions except the one in Wheaton. And while well, here, I mean, I could go to work and go you know go out. So I get there, I get there, and there was only one person that I shared with. It was my company commander. It wasn't even anybody from my platoon. Then I find out that there were people from the recon platoon from 1969 that were there. And then I find out that you don't get, ever get anybody from the recon platoon from 1968 never shows up at the reunions. I mean, did we have it that bad? You know, with the with the, the fighting aspect of it, with the mental thing? Did we have it that, that much harder than they did afterward? Maybe, maybe so. You know, maybe so that you can't you can't get out from under that under that that mountain that's on on your on your on your mind, on your head, on your shoulders, wherever. You know, and, you'll, and and my advice, my suggestion, I say advice, my suggestion, you know, take a trip to the wall. You will never regret it. You know, it's the most viewed monument in in D.C., but. You'll never regret it. You'll understand more, especially now that you have the wall. You have the statue of the three soldiers. You also have the you also have the nurse's statue. The wall is like 
I mean, I went my son along in December, you know, and, and uh, he, he never he, he was interested in Vietnam, but you know, had never never said to come to the wall in December. He was actually he was actually leaving my daughter, and he was moving back to Brazil. He was Brazilian. I took him to the wall, and, we were, and I ran into people there, and you know, they, they were just not anybody I knew. It was just just people just talking to me, you know, talking about talking about talking about the wall and, and what have you. It's just well, I will. Go I will. Thank you. Good. Um, before we close, have you ever um, wanted or, or have you been back to Vietnam? I want to go. It's part of it. Yeah, I wanted to go. I wanted to go. It's just like, you know, my friends don't want to go. My wife doesn't want to go. My daughter would have went because one time we were on vacations before she had, had my grandson. Oh, yeah, next time we're going to go to Vietnam. We're going to go to camp. But I see mother's never going to go. She'll go. You know, my daughter, she'll go. You know, it's like, so I don't know. Yeah, I'd like to go. Dennis, who, who, who you know, has been back. And it was like, Dennis, how did you go to how did you go to Vietnam with the hotel and this sure thing for thirteen hundred dollars? I mean, it's like two, three thousand just the airfare. I mean, like, yeah, I'd like to go, but I don't want to go on a tour. I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go places like the tour that the tour he went on that that gave me the paper. It was Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, I call it Saigon Way, which is the imperial capital. And Hoi An, which is up in that area, up in that area by way. Then it was Hanoi and Haiphong. I don't want to go to North Vietnam. I don't want to go to Hanoi. I don't want to go anywhere near Ho Chi Minh. I, you know, I just don't I'd go there. I would rather go. go I, you're never going to get to go exactly where you were stationed in Vietnam because they're not going to let you go anywhere out near anywhere near space camps because they're still using them. But I mean, in that area, and, and to, to think of what the roads were like and what they look like now, it's four-lane blacktop highways. And, you know, there, there was a two-lane two blacktop, and those price pages were right up to the road. I mean, it's crazy. And when I say about burying all the stuff with the Vietnamese, I encountered, years ago, I encountered a thing with the Vietnamese, with the veter Vietnamese veterans, and it's strange. You look at then, the Vietnamese men held hands. So... We thought they were mm. gay, you know. That's the way they showed friendship, friendship. So when I met them, I said, "We're staying out there on Broadway. And, you, know, and you feel strange. You're holding hands with you. an old man there. Looked like Ho Chi Minh. Had a long, droopy, you know, white mustache. And uh, they call him Colonel Wan. And uh, the Vietnamese used to uh, give him a lot of BS. Oh, he was nothing but a policeman, you know." Well, they had different type of police. They had the, the, the field police and the military police. They had, you know, the Khan side and the Quan Khan and all of this stuff, right? Well, I'm talking to the old man one day, and uh, it turns out the old man was a paratrooper. He fought with the French against Ho Chi Minh in the, in the first, first Indochina War. He's sitting in an airplane. The props are turning. They're on the tarmac. They're, in the, they're going to make a combat jump. When D and B and Fu fell, they were going from wherever they were flying out of Saigon. They were going to D and B and Fu. So it was. And you met that man. I met that man here in Chicago. I mean, oh, you had to be in the seventy. You know, I had to be in the seventy. Then he was the yeah. Colonel Lyon. You know, it's just like when I say about the strangeness, strange stuff. I mean, yeah. I mean, how am I going to say? Well, if, no, I will not do this people because this guy. Fought against Ho Chi Minh in the 40s and in the 50s. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, it, yeah. it really, it's really crazy. The the experience that I've had, and, and even the Vietnamese veterans that I've encountered, you know, are like unbelievable. I mean, naval officers, helicopter pilots, you know, air, you know, pilots, rangers, Vietnamese Marines. Because when you really got down to the when you really got down to the fighting forces in the Vietnamese Army, the Vietnamese Marine Division was top quality. They were part of the National Reserve. They were 100% volunteer, 100% anti-communist. The Vietnamese paratroopers, the airborne, same thing. The other half of the Strategic Reserve, the Vietnamese Rangers. Then you had individual units, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, in fact, uh, at the end of 1975, at the Town of Swanlock which is Saigon is here. Swan Lock is like going north like this, but it's still in South Vietnam. The worst infantry division in the, in the Vietnamese Army, the 18th Infantry Division, fought to a standstill for three weeks, three North Vietnamese divisions with tanks. 
and they didn't have tanks in 75. I mean, they, they yeah, you know, it's, I mean, if you're in a library, you want to read, you want to, you want to read a good book, you might have it right here on a shelf, you know, Tears Before the Rain. Tears Before the Rain. I think you mentioned that once before. Yeah, or somebody, someone did, yeah. Tears Before the Rain. It's an oral history of the fall of South Vietnam by individuals. But what really hooked me, and I had the book, I purchased it years ago, and I had it in a box, and I, I was going through the books, I'm going to Roger and Carlson, you know, like, you know, I, I was, do I bring it to the library? You know, do, do I come to the library? You know, I, I didn't know what to do with the books, right? I still have some. Here it is, unread, sitting for 20 years, and it was unread. Open a book up, start reading, goes, my God. The first chapter was by a stewardess who was on the plane, it was the last flight out of Da Nang wow. in 1975, where if you read, and I don't know how old you are, so let's, I'm going to hope you recall this aircraft, right? The, mm -hmm. the 727 mm -hmm. had the three jets and had a, it had a, 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 a walkway in the back that under, the, that's the one where the guy was, the guy from the airlines was standing on there fighting the people, beating the people off the ramp when they were trying to take off from Da Nang. First one, the first chapter in there. My God, it went through that, and it went through the CIA, and it went through the stuff at the embassy, and, and uh, South Vietnamese military, and the NBA, and and the uh, the Bodoi. Okay, Bodoi are, are the Bodoi in Vietnamese means the dust of life. The dust of life are the Amerasian kids. Mm. So all of this is incorporated in this book. And we, we you talk about everything. Are these kids not American citizens by birth? I mean, you had an American father, and they're not, are they not, are they not, really, are they not a citizen? If you, if, if an immigrant family comes here from, from Mexico or whatever, and they have a kid here, and the kid's automatically an American citizen. If an American, if an American citizen has a child with, with an, uh, somebody in another country, is that child American citizen or not? Yeah. This uh, picture here, uh, where you're surrounded by these, these children, that's, uh, no, this is just right. This is just, this is not Bodoi. This is Vietnamese kids. We went down to this village. Medcap is when you go down with the medical with mm -hmm. your officers, and, you know, and they they go down and and do medical trip on the kids. Well, we they had to have security, so we you know we were security. I just sat down here. I actually I sat down. I sat down here, and uh, I was taking pictures of the kids, right? Take a picture, and the kid took my camera, stood up here, and took a picture of me with the kids. But my wife always says that's your father figure. <laughs> Yeah. That's a great picture, which we will add to the uh, the interview in the appendix. But I mean, look at the picture. You know, look at the picture, and look at my face. Disconnect. Look at the picture. Look yeah. at my face. Yeah. I'm 73 years old. I was 24. Yeah. How much of a difference is there in my face? Not too much. What do you think? I could, you know, yeah. I, it looks like you. I know I don't. I know I don't show my. I know I. I don't. I know I don't show that I'm 73 years old. No, no. Well, Marty, thank you for... Uh, I mean, I thought the other, you know, I, other, and I thought, first I did these two pictures. Yeah. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm going on, is there anything else? I thought you, you know, when I was going to talk about the unit, maybe... It moved yeah, the no, that's an excellent choice. This one here. <laughs> yeah. If you don't want that one, I'll take it. No, I do, I do. And, uh, you know, if there's a reason, I, I got, I, I have a picture, I have a couple of pictures of the that APC that I was on that was destroyed by the rock with bell grenades. One of the pictures was taken from the front, we see the front of the APC, and there were two people over here, one of those people was me. Wow. That might be a good picture to include in the, uh, All right. the interview. Yeah. I know where you're at. You do, and... Uh, Marty, I want to thank you for an eloquent. Uh, well, it's not eloquent. I mean, I, no, it was it, far it, from eloquent. I've listened to a lot of interviews. It's an eloquent, very generous interview, and uh, I may have worked in the library for a long time, but I learned a lot today. I could probably be more descriptive, Neil. Thank really. you. Yeah. Like I said, she said four hours. I probably could easily 